Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be back here in the Fort Worth area, and I'm quite honored to be on the program here this evening and to be the final speaker for the evening. In the year 1859, Charles Darwin published his famous book on the origin of the species, a book which uh, revolutionized the thinking of the Western world with reference to the origin of man. In the very last sentence of that book, Darwin suggested that the Creator had initially breathed into one or a few original forms the breath of life. And from that lowly beginning, all forms of life had evolved and were in the process of evolving. Most of us don't think of Charles Darwin as a theistic evolutionist, but he was, in fact, at the time that he wrote that book. He himself later evolved into an agnostic, uh, thus suggesting that there was not sufficient evidence to prove the existence of a creator. And that is not an uncommon path that many evolutionists pursue. We're talking tonight about theistic evolution, but in order to really appreciate that, we've got to contrast it, at least momentarily, with atheistic evolution. Atheistic evolution is the idea that the entire universe can be explained in some sort of naturalistic or mechanistic uh, process. It is self-explanatory. If you do not believe in the existence of God, there are only two things you can possibly say about the universe. You must either contend that it has always existed in some form or another, or you must argue that somehow or another it created itself from nothing. Now neither of those options are viable. But the fact of the matter is we know for a scientific certainty that the universe is not eternal. Dr. Robert Jastrow, who is probably the country's most prominent scientific writer, authored a book just a few years ago entitled, Until the Sun Dies. And in that book, he contended that based upon what we know about the operation of the second law of thermodynamics, that is the idea that the universe is running down. There is the built-in implication that it's not eternal. As a matter of fact, scientists concede that the universe is not eternal when they tell us, for example, that it's 20 billion years old. Now, I don't accept that date, but I'm merely pointing out that whenever you date the universe, you suggest that it is not infinite in its existence. So, on a scientific basis, we must reject the idea of the eternality of the universe. Well, the other concept that the universe somehow or another created itself from nothing is an absolute absurdity. No material thing has the intrinsic ability to create itself from nothing. However, recently, a scientist by the name of Edward Tryon, writing an article in the New Scientist magazine, offered this very idea. He said the universe created itself by means of a quantum fluctuation. 
in a true vacuum or out of a state of nothingness. Now, I want to tell you, you've got to watch those quantum fluctuations. <laughs> Especially when they occur in a state of nothingness. And so these two ideas concerning the universe are not credible positions. And a lot of folks recognize that. If you consider the laws of the universe, you will be forced to the conclusion that there is a great mind, a divine personality behind the universe that is responsible for bringing it into existence. However, on the other hand, we have been for the better part of the century absolutely subjected to a media blitz concerning the idea that evolution is true. You're not intelligent if you don't believe in evolution. You're not sophisticated if you don't believe in evolution. Why are we to believe in evolution? Because everybody believes in evolution. And so a lot of folks have been stampeded towards the idea that somehow or another we've got to blend together the concept of a God on the one hand and the process of evolution on the other hand. And that's what you call theistic evolution. God is the starter of the process and evolution is the mechanism that he employed in bringing about the wonderful world of living things. Now, theistic evolutionists come in all shapes and sizes and breeds and classifications. Some, for example, contend that God was responsible for creating the initial molecular structure of matter, but that from that point onward, the evolutionary process took over, including the concept of the spontaneous generation of life from the non-living. Others would suggest that God got into the picture a little further on down the line. That perhaps God created the initial spark of life with which matter was infused and then later, subsequent to that, the evolutionary process was set in motion. And still others are a little bit more generous with God's activity. They contend that every now and then He stuck His finger into the pie, so to speak, and interrupted the natural course of events so that uh, evolution is the general mode of operation, but God occasionally dips into the picture. For example, they might argue that we evolved our physical bodies from lower forms of life, but then at a proper point in time, God infused the soul within us so that physically we are uh, from an animal form of life, but spiritually we owe our existence to God. And so there are all sorts of compromises and concepts that have been conjured up to try to harmonize the idea of God with the evolutionary concept. Now, I'd like tonight to speak uh, at some length on the failure of evolution to be a credible theory from a biological or geological or anthropological or scientific standpoint generally. But that, of course, is not the purpose of the presentation this evening. We're addressing specifically the idea of theistic evolution. In other words, can the idea of evolution be harmonized with the Bible? Can you reverence the Bible as the Word of God and still some way or another work the evolutionary scenario into that? And there are all kinds of religionists who will tell us that you don't do any harm to the Bible by believing in evolution. Oh, well, there are certain things that you have to look at in another light. You've got to symbolically figuratively view some passages that perhaps you have previously viewed as literal. But really, in the final analysis, you do no harm 
to the Genesis record or other parts of the Word of God by accepting the evolutionary concept as well. Folks, that simply is not the case. I want to spend the burden of my time tonight uh, introducing about 12 or 15 arguments that show that there is a direct clash between the teaching of the Bible in Genesis and in related creation contexts between the biblical viewpoint and the evolutionary idea of the universe or of the origin of man. All right, point number one. The Bible teaches that on the first day of the creation week, God said, let there be light. And there was light. It was not until the fourth day of that initial week that God made the sun and the moon and the stars and the other luminaries in the heavens. The Bible therefore teaches that light existed before the sun ever came into being. By way of contrast, the evolutionary theory teaches that the sun was the earth's first source of light. There is a direct conflict, therefore, between evolution and the very first verse of Genesis chapter 1. Number two, the Bible teaches that the earth, as it was initially formed, was in a liquid state. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void or empty. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep. Now, on the second day of creation, God caused dry land to appear. So, what is the biblical order? Number one, water. Number two, dry land. On the other hand, the evolutionary idea is that the earth cooled off and became solidified and then by and by, after millions of years, water seeped out of Mother Earth's bowels and formed the various oceans which are now a part of this planet. So the Bible order is water first, dry land second. The evolutionary order is dry first, water second. A direct conflict. Number three, the Bible teaches that plants were created on the third day. The wonderful world of botany miraculously burst into existence on the third day of the creation week. But the Bible teaches that the sun was not made until the fourth day. So the biblical order is plants first, sun second. Now there is no problem with that whatsoever if you consider Genesis chapter 1 to be a miraculous account. A miraculous record of miraculous creative events. But the evolutionary idea is this, that the sun was shining upon Mother Earth for millions of years before plants ever evolved. And so the Bible order is plants first, sun second. The evolutionary order is sun first, plants second. You can't reconcile those two. Number four, the Bible teaches that plants were created on the third day of the creation week and that later on, on the fifth day of the creation week, the waters began to teem with marine life. And so you've got plants first, marine life second. The evolutionary order is that the first forms of life on the earth were in the ocean. Marine organisms. And then later on, many eons later, as a matter of fact, plants evolved. Again, I submit a direct clash between the two philosophies. In the fifth place, the Bible teaches that on the third day of creation, fruit-bearing trees were created. And again, it was not until the fifth day that fish were formed in the seas. But once more, the evolutionary scenario says that fish existed in the sea for many millions of years before 
fruit-bearing trees evolved upon the earth. Again, a clash. Number six, the Bible teaches that birds were created first on the fifth day of the creation week. And it was not until the sixth day that creeping things came into existence, which is a generic term having to do both with reptiles and insects. So what's the Bible order? Birds first, reptiles, insects second. Well, as everybody knows who's taken a freshman biology course, the evolutionary concept teaches that Birds evolved from reptiles. You have reptiles first. From reptiles came amphibians. And then subsequent to that, birds were evolved. And I've heard evolutionary professors make the argument that you can look at a chicken. And note that a chicken has scales on its legs. And that's supposed to prove that chickens evolved from scaled reptiles. In order to make such an astute observation as that, of course, you have to have uh, a degree in chickenology. <laughs> There's absolutely no proof in drawing some sort of an analogy of that nature. Yet that's the evolutionary concept. Number seven, the Bible teaches that organisms were created according to basic kinds. The word kind is used repeatedly in Genesis chapter 1. Certain biological kinds were created and then those kinds reproduced after their kinds. That, of course, allows for horizontal variation. Nobody who's a creationist that I know of believe that God created collies and chihuahuas and poodles and St. Bernard's individually. But God created a dog kind and there is variability allowed within that. But the Bible does not allow for what we call vertical macroevolution. The crossing of phylogenetic boundaries. Horses don't produce cattle, cats don't produce dogs, and monkeys don't produce men. But in order to have the evolutionary concept working, you have to have like producing unlike. You have to have jumping across from one kind to another. And you know, some biologists used to say that all forms of life uh, perhaps evolved from a few simple forms and they rebuked us when we quoted them as saying all forms of life came from an initial life source, one life source. But now they're not saying that so much anymore because they know now that all living organisms are composed of the common chemical stuff, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. All living organisms have the very same biological chemical composition. But it's how the chemical is arranged that determines whether a mouse will be made or a man will be made. But everything produces after its kind. And DNA is the language of life. And so again, evolution in the Bible conflicts at this point. Number eight, the Bible teaches Jehovah God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Evolution teaches, on the other hand, that man originally came out of the sea. Do you know the difference between sea and dust? God said to Adam, from the dust you were taken and to the dust you shall return. I remember a number of years ago when I was taking a biology course at one of our colleges in California, the professor made the observation that it was an evidence that we had our origin in the sea, that our blood saline percentage 
was remarkably analogous to the saline percentage of the ocean. And therefore that seemed to indicate that we came out of the sea. Well, it indicates no such thing. It indicates that there was a chemist who perhaps had a plan that was somewhat similar in various domains. But it's an egregious assumption to suggest that that argues that we came from the sea. The Bible says we came from the ground. In the ninth place, the Bible teaches that the first human beings were created sexually distinctive. Our Lord Jesus said this, and by the way, His credibility is under consideration here. You cannot believe in evolution without casting a reflection upon Jesus. Jesus believed in the Mosaic writings. He said in the last couple of verses in John chapter 5, if you don't believe Moses, how can you believe me? For he wrote concerning me. But Jesus said in Matthew 19, 4, have ye not read, and he's quoting from Genesis, that he who made them in the beginning made them male and female. They were made male and female. But the evolutionary idea is that there was a bisexual blob at some point in the ancient past that ultimately evolved into the male and female sexes. That's an irreconcilable difference. Number 10... The Bible teaches that we are directly created by God. As I referred to a moment ago in Genesis 2-7, Jehovah God formed man from the dust of the ground. Well, as we have it in our song, Thou art the potter, we are the clay. Mold us and make us after Thy will. And so, very appropriately, in tracing the genealogical record of Jesus from Mary all the way back to Adam, Luke, in Luke chapter 3, refers to Adam as a son of God. Because we're from the hand of God. On the other hand, evolutionists maintain that we are sons of God of chimpanzees. A Lutheran theologian by the name of Helmut Thaliki made the statement that our grandparents are monkeys and our great-grandparents are tadpoles. And he said, that does not disturb me in the least. And by the way, he is quoted with approval in a little booklet called Evolution and Creationism that was authored by Neil Buffalo and Patrick Murray. And Neil Buffalo is a former elder of the Lord's Church over in Arkansas who has since migrated to the Christian Church. And Patrick Murray was an Episcopal clergyman. And they combined their talents and argued the case for theistic evolution. And he said, it doesn't bother me at all that we ascend or descended from monkeys and tadpoles. It may be arrogance on my part. I don't think so. I view my origin as being higher than that. (laughs) Number 11. The Bible teaches that man has fallen. He was created in the image of God. He was created holy and upright, but by his own choice, free will power, as Brother Workman referred to in the previous presentation. He chose to do evil, and hence he has fallen from his holy estate. And Paul said in one of his letters to Timothy that evil men and seducers wax worse and worse. We're not getting better every day in every way. Rather, mankind is getting worse as he digresses throughout time. But the evolutionary idea is that man has come up 
Back in the early 70s, a British scholar by the name of Bronowski wrote a book entitled The Ascent of Man. And they produced a television series based upon that book. Evolution, therefore, says that man has clawed his way upward. The Bible says that man has fallen downward. And there is conflict between those statements. Number 12, the Bible teaches that Adam and Eve were real flesh and blood human beings. In Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul said that death reigned from Adam unto Moses. Was Moses a real person? Was he actually an historical character? Yes, indeed. So was Adam. He's mentioned in the same context. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 that the serpent through his guile seduced Eve. And in 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 12, the Apostle Paul says that Eve did not sin first, or Adam rather didn't sin first, but Eve did. And that initial couple fell into transgression as a consequence of that. Adam, Eve, called by name and stamped with the stamp of historicity. On the other hand, modern theologians have argued that Adam and Eve are not real beings. They are merely myths, fairy tales, legendary characters incorporated into the biblical text to give an explanation as to how humanity started. And unfortunately, that phenomenon is not confined to the denominational world. Some of our own brethren have been so bold as to classify Genesis chapter 1 as a myth or a creation hymn. God forbid. The Genesis account is a real historical account and Jesus identified it as such. Number 13, the Bible teaches that humanity has existed since the beginning of the universe. Now that's going to shock a lot of people to the core. Because uh, so many folks have been brainwashed with the idea that the universe is billions of years old. Evolutionary chronologists argue that the universe is 20 billion years old. And that our earth is 4.5 to 5 billion years old. That life evolved about 2 billion years ago. And man arrived at his present status about 3 million years ago. Now contrast man's arrival, 3 million, with this earth, 5 billion You've got something on the order of about 1 to 1,250. Man is just a speck on the panorama of time. George Gaylord Simpson, who was known as Mr. Evolution, and he taught for many years at Harvard University, made the statement that man is a Johnny-come-lately on the planet Earth. And some of our own brethren, apparently quoting him, have made an almost identical statement. One brother has said that man is a newcomer to the planet Earth. The Bible teaches otherwise. The Bible teaches, for example, in Mark chapter 10 and verse 6, and this is Mark's parallel of what Matthew had to say in Matthew 19, 4 and following. Mark's record of what Jesus said is this. Listen to it carefully, folks. Have ye not read that he who made them from the beginning of the creation? Notice the definite article. The creation. Absolute creation. Made them male and female. What did the Lord say? The Lord said Adam and Eve existed from the creation made in the very same week of six literal days. 
days that were analogous to the Sabbath day. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. What kind of a day was the Sabbath day? An ordinary day. No Jew had any problem with that. Why remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? For in six days God created the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in them is. What kind of days of creation? Try substituting the word age for the word day in that concept and see what kind of sense it makes. In six ages God created the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in them is. Therefore keep the Sabbath age. It makes no sense at all. Words have got to be interpreted consistently within a context. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1 verse 20 argues very effectively that evidences for the existence of God have been perceived by humanity since the beginning of creation. And the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 21, That God as the creator has been known from the foundations of the world. That puts humanity right at the very beginning. But someone says, oh brother Wayne, is it not true that there are multiple scientific evidences which indicate vast ages for the universe? No, there are not. All of the so-called scientific techniques for dating are laced with buttressed with evolutionary, uniformitarian assumptions built into the system to give them the ages that they need for the evolutionary concept. If you don't have time, you don't have evolution. You don't have evolution with time. But you certainly don't have it, even according to their admission, if you don't have the time. Time is the God of evolution. I'm surprised that some of them don't fall down three times a day and do obeisance to a clock. That's how significant time is to that philosophy. Professor Jastrow said in his book that I alluded to earlier, Until the Sun Dies, if you do not have vast ages of time, the evolutionary concept does not work. Let me just throw out one little point to whet your appetite. Did you know that the sun is burning up? It's burning up. It's shrinking. Scientists say that the sun is shrinking at the rate of five feet an hour. Burning up. You feel yourself getting cold? Well, they say it won't happen for millions of years yet, but they contend that if it lasts long enough, the sun will will burn out. Well, if it's shrinking five feet per hour, logic tells you that if you just look back into the past, then every hour you get back into the past, it's five feet larger, right? Five feet smaller in the future, five feet larger in the past. You only have to go back 100,000 years to get the sun twice as large as it is now. And if you go back 20 million years, the sun is actually touching the earth. You talk about a hot time in the old town tonight. (laughs) Now, folks, listen, listen. That's 20 million years. They claimed that dinosaurs were wandering around here on earth a hundred million years ago. Don't you know they had a tan? (laughs) So there is no scientific... There are many scientific evidences against the idea that the universe and the earth is very, very old. And many evidences that argue for a young earth. But the Bible teaches that humanity goes back to the very beginning of time. The Bible also teaches that man was created to have dominion over everything that moves on the face of the earth. Read Genesis chapter 1, verse 30 and onward. Evolution, on the other hand, claims that many, many multiplied thousands of organisms lived and died and became extinct before man ever came along. They contend, for example, that humans and dinosaurs were never contemporary. How could man, therefore, ever have exercised 
authority, dominion over dinosaurs if they were gone before he ever got here. There is a fundamental conflict between that idea and the biblical idea. Finally, let me mention this. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 1 and also in verse 2, the Bible suggests that when God finished His creation activity at the end of the sixth day, that the work of creation was finished. There's no creation going on today. As a matter of fact, that harmonizes beautifully with a law called the first law of thermodynamics, which says that according to present processes, Neither matter nor energy is being created today. No creation today. Nothing is being destroyed today. It's only being changed from one form to another. There is no creation now. But if you believe in evolution, you've got to believe in some ongoing creative process. You can't have the molecules to man idea. The simple to the complex without some kind of creative power that oops that thing along, that scale. And so there is again a fundamental conflict between the Bible teaching and the evolutionary teaching. Why is it that we degrade ourselves by yielding to that kind of ungodly, anti-biblical, God-dishonoring doctrine? We don't have to drop our heads, brethren, when we contend for a literal approach to the Bible. If we just prepare ourselves, if we study the information, we can throw our heads up and our shoulders back and we can march forth confident that our case can absolutely be defended consistently on the basis of biblical evidence, scientifically, any way you want to approach it, historically. And I don't cow down to anybody in the unbelieving community. God help us to defend the integrity of His cause and to infuse into our young people a greater sense of courage and knowledge to defend God's account of creation and the dignity of man as one who is in the image of the Creator. Amen. Amen.